Hello and welcome to Newcastle Writers Festival's Stories to You Weekend of Ideas and Writing. This is a brave and brilliant initiative and I really want to congratulate the festival team on making it happen so swiftly. I think it might be the first online Writers Festival in the world. Anyway, my name's Ailsa Piper and I am a writer, a performer, a director, a teacher and a talker, hopefully today a listener. With me in virtual space is Charlotte Wood. Hi Charlotte. Hello Ailsa, hello everybody. And thank you to the Newcastle Writers Festival. It's a brilliant idea. Um, Miss Charlotte is the author of six novels and two books of non-fiction. I'm sure you all know this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Along with a swathe of insight-filled essays and articles and speeches. All of those things are easily accessible on her brilliant website, by the way. Along with a terrific podcast that she's currently making, which is an extension of her book called The Writer's Room Interviews, which you can see over there. <laughs> Charlotte is a shapeshifter as a writer. Um, she surprises her readers with each book, with a different world, a different tone. But she's probably best known for her dystopian novel, her brilliant dystopian novel, The Natural Way of Things. It won the Stella Prize, the Indie Book of the Year, and the Novel of the Year. Um, and it was the joint winner of the Prime Minister's Literary Award for Fiction. Deservedly so. But we are here to discuss her latest novel, The Weekend, which is a radical change of pace and style again. So Charlotte, instead of me banging on anymore, would you like to do the introductions to the world of the book and the characters? Thank you, Elsa. I would love to. This is um, the book, The Weekend. And it is a book about, I hope about a lot of things, but about friendship and growing older and kind of about the um, illusions we have about ourselves. So the book opens with three women friends coming together for uh, the weekend just before Christmas at the beach house of their recently deceased and very much loved friend, fourth friend, Sylvie. So these women have been friends for about 40 years. They're all in their 70s. They kind of feel like they know who they are. They've, you know, they're at that point where they um, feel that they have no illusions about life anymore. They know how things are pretty much going to unfold for them from here. They're all in grief for their beloved friend, Sylvie, who was the one who sort of held the group together in some ways. She was kind of the glue um, that kept this little circle of friends tightly together for all those years. Um, but over the course of this weekend, they uh, have to start to face up to some um, difficult truths about not only their friendships with each other, but their illusions about themselves. And the other important character in the book is the dog called Finn. And um, Finn belongs to Wendy, one of the women. He's a very ancient um, kind of dilapidated poor old dog who is pretty much falling apart you know he's he's got arthritis he's deaf he's a bit blind he's um got dementia as dogs do so he does things like go and stare at a wall for two hours or sort of bark at nothing and does a lot of pacing and um he's wendy adores him and has been sort of it's been suggested to her that she should put him down and put him out of his misery but she loves him and she can't bear to do that um so she brings him along un unannounced to the um weekend which is uh does not go down well with at least one of the other women it's interesting because the book has been said to be about aging i think it's about many other things but finn kind of carries all the fears about aging doesn't he Do you want to just talk a bit about that before we talk about the beginnings of the book i'm i'm interested in finn and where he came from Thank you. Yes, Finn, um, I had a problem when I started writing the book because I wanted to write about ageing in a way that wasn't about decline and decrepitude and stasis and sort of um, misery because when I, the people I know in their 70s are living their lives as fully as I live mine at, in my mid-50s, um, and I wanted to write about these women who have been very powerful in their um, professional lives and in their personal lives. There's sort of that generation of feminists who kind of um, took charge of the cultural conversation and that sort of thing. 
Um, so they don't, they, they have no interest in the topic of aging. You know, they're not interested in, um, they don't see themselves as defined by how old they are. So it was going to be difficult for me to actually investigate our cultural disgust and um, our feelings and our fears and our kind of um, horror of aging through these women themselves. But so that's how Finn became very, very useful because he can reflect all these sort of secret fears and things that people have about aging. But uh, the dog came about through a kind of amazingly lucky experience for me. I was um, fortunate enough to be the first writer in residence at the Charles Perkins Centre, which is a multidisciplinary health research facility at the University of Sydney. So it's a building full of very hardcore scientists, um, medical people, nurses, but also uh, because this world leading um, multidisciplinary place, there are philosophers and economists and historians, and now a writer in residence. And that has amazingly been funded from the beginning by a philanthropist called Judy Harris, who has given $100,000 a year for one writer to be just in the building, brushing up against scientists, working on their book, um, but having sort of serendipitous connections and conversations with the people who work in the building. So I was there working on my book about three old women and I had a chat with um, an evolutionary biologist and- um, As you do. <laughs> as you do. Uh, called David Robenheimer, who's one of the top people in this place. And um, David said something quite, I found quite odd, which was that he would like to see some evolutionary biology in my novel coming out of this residency. And ordinarily, if someone told me what they wanted to see in my novel while I was at the start of writing it, I would be very um, protective of my creativity and my you know, privacy and all of that. But because I was there to be influenced and to influence, that's the whole point of that residency, I didn't kind of bring down the shutters as I normally would on, you know, mentally on that conversation. So I sort of kept talking and said, what do you mean? Um, I have no idea what you mean. And, and he said, well, listen, animal aging is far more accelerated than human aging. So maybe it would be interesting to... Um, look at animal aging at the same time as human aging in your book. And I thought, wow, that's an interesting thing to think about. But I still had no idea of how that could um, actually work. Um, but then a few days later, I, I realised that my friend Prue had a very ancient old dog called Finn, who was basically, you know, my Finn is an exact replica of her Finn, except my Finn's a boy and her Finn was a girl. Um, and her fin, the dog, was uh, eventually euthanized, and and sh that dog was doing all these same sort of behaviors of dementing and becoming incontinent and all that sort of stuff. And I suddenly saw how bringing the dog into my group of women could be incredibly useful. Not only because then he can be this sort of carrier of all of the kind of um, our society's um, attitudes towards dependence, vulnerability, um, decline, you know, the kind of um, disgust that, that Jude has, for example, of having to look at this dog. It's just um, anathema to her. Um, and then it's when like their some... fears, it's like their fears made manifest, isn't it? Every time they look at Finn, it's the deepest fears. That's like right. Mm. And and they're not voiced, you know. So I think that's sort of truthful as well, that they don't, they're not, um, they're not uh, consciously talked about. They're just these kind of frightening things at the back of their minds. Mm. But also kind of narratively speaking, very, very useful to have an uninvited, incontinent, decrepit dog coming along when you're supposed to be cleaning up a beach house and, you know, causing friction and tension and, um, but, but the third um, wonderful uh, role that Finn allowed me in the book was 
to to bring to the novel what um, what Amanda Laurie might call uh, messages from another realm. She said that to me in an um, interview for the writers' room years ago, and it was so useful to me because I realised that I I wanted to um, always have this sense of some slightly other otherworldliness, some other um, consciousness other than just the natural. I mean, the the real visible world. It was a long answer, sorry. No, no, it's good because it actually opens out to a lot of things. So what we haven't done actually is talk about the three women and the compression that they're under because, you know, we say a beach house. Beach house mm -hmm. is a lovely thing, but you've created this very, very particular world. A world I might say that I've had people in three different states read this book and they all say they know exactly what the town is. But of ah, course, that's fantastic. <laughs> The town is your observations and amalgamations. But let's talk about the three characters because what happens to them because of the intensity of being put in this place to serve someone they love, a dead friend, is a kind of compression, not unlike, of course, what many of us are experiencing in lockdown or isolation at the moment, that the world comes in very small and close. So we have three women. We have Jude, who is a restaurateur. Do you want to just talk a bit about the three of them? Individually? Sure. Yes. Jude is... Um, My favourite. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how much she is people's favourite. And she's oh, really? the meanest one. A lot of people have said, have sort of come to me after a reading or something and, and said, I'm Jude. <laughs> and um, with a kind of certain amount of pride, it has to be said. Um, they're sort of confessing it, but also secretly proud of it. But so Jude is probably the most difficult um, person in the group. She arguably. Is, arguably. <laughs> I think she's very loving, really, but she actually is not very good at expressing um, her feelings. So Jude, as you say, was a famous restaurateur. She was one of those women uh, that I think every city has that who, runs the city's finest restaurants for decades. You know, she, she ran these um, fancy restaurants. She was the front of house person. She was the one who said whether you get a table or you don't and all the sort of um, movers and shakers would eat at her restaurants. Jude hasn't been working for some time, but she's not under any kind of um, material um, strain or pressure because she's also for about 40 years been having a relationship with um, a married man called Daniel and Daniel's sort of money comes in and out of Jude's life through Daniel she never she sort of she lives in an apartment that Daniel pays for um, so that's of no problem to her um, she is very, Jude sees herself as a very generous person but um, other people might not exactly see it that way. Some people feel that she's maybe a bit of a control freak, whereas she would just think, well, she gets things done properly. You know, she's got standards. Um, and she often seems a bit um, confused by the fact that people don't know how, how much she loves them. At one point, she's looking at Wendy and saying, well, of course she loves Wendy. It would be ridiculous to say it after all these years, I mean, it would be embarrassing. Everyone would not know what to do. So, I mean, it's silly that, um, you know, Wendy's getting upset about some little aside where clearly Jude has nothing but respect and affection for her. You know, it's interesting. That goes to one of the things that you pluck out beautifully all the way through the book is the self-delusion that we all are guilty of. But it's very present for you. It's an interesting thing to you, it seems to me people's opinions or senses of themselves? Yes. Well, perhaps, you know, my own self-delusions have been... Um, I do think as, as we get older, we often... I, look, I used to think as you grow older, you automatically begin to know yourself better and better. And that's, you know, as it should be. Um, but I don't think that anymore. I think that it's entirely possible to be completely deluded about the kind of person you are, um, you know, at any point until you die, really. And I think that old friends are sometimes the ones who present us with uh, a bit of a shock about who we are, the kind of, um, 
you know, Jude's generosity that she's always, taught, she said, well, her generosity is legendary. You know, this is all she said in her head. And, and then she sort of realises that at, at some time ago, her sister-in-law sort of murmured, well, it's not all that generous if you have to keep talking about it. And, <laughs> and Jude, Jude is sort of just, just outraged by this remark because, you know, it's sort of, and I find it, I mean, it's weird. I feel like these people are real, but I find her I, a very yeah. poignant character because she, she wants to be loving to people, but something in her is just held back from being able to express this in a kind of what she would say, a kind of lovey dovey, you know, gushy way. That's just not her way. Um, you know, and then the of course you have in counterpoint to her, you've got Adele who is all sort of exterior in a way, isn't she? I mean, well, talk about Adele. Mm. Yeah. Adele. I do love Adele. Adele mm. is an actress, a very fine stage actress. And she, she certainly is, possibly um the most diametrically opposed to jude in that she's very she's she's not self-contained she's sort of everything's all out there all the time she's um she is also very generous but she's um you know quite haphazard in her life um jude is highly controlled highly organized you know has lots of money um adele is look she's been an actress all her life and any of us who work in the arts know that that is a precarious existence being a writer is a precarious existence but you have to have the courage to keep going in the face of no guarantees of income of work of being able to even present your work um you know we can all Which, go and write know, books and in itself that's a kind of delusion a self-delusion as well isn't it you sort of say that that thing of adele's of saying everything will be all right somehow it's yes. another kind of self-delusion, isn't it? And I think all artists have to operate under that self-delusion, you know. Otherwise, if you need security and guarantees, you can't be an artist. Um, and in fact, uh, the wonderful new book, which I'm just, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but this great book called How to Be an Artist by Jerry Saltz is new. And, and in one of his rules for being an artist is be delusional you know, about your talent, about the possibility of making great work, because you need to have that reach and ambition and, um, and risk taking. So Adele has always been a risk taker, which means she's broke. Uh, on the morning that she comes to the house, um, she's just realising that her girlfriend of the last year or so, uh, Liz, who she's moved in with, who's quite a bit younger than her, um, is kind of is breaking up with her and is kicking her out. And that means that Adele actually doesn't strictly have anywhere to live now. But she doesn't want to tell the others about this because she's embarrassed. It's the kind of thing that's happened to her, you know, a few times. Her friends have had to help her out before. She just can't bear the idea of asking them for help again. So she's sort of over this weekend surreptitiously checking her bank account to see if some little extra bit of money has miraculously appeared. Um, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, that even between friends of 40 years, I mean, I think it's a beautiful capture in the book, that somehow money is the unspeakable, even more unspeakable maybe than sex or, you know, anything else. And, and that shame around not having earnings is very pronounced for her. Yes, and I think the older we get, the shame about not having um, savings and organised our incomes and all of that. I mean, every person I know who works in the arts I don't know anyone. Some people have a little bit of superannuation, but you know, when you work for yourself and your most artists are just really barely paying the rent. Um, I'm going to say artists. It's, it's not just artists, though. It's the new poor, isn't it? The sort of older woman is. You know, that's one of the demographics of the new poor. They say it is. It is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Adele says at one point, artistic poverty when you're young is romantic. But it's after 50 that people start despising you for it. And I think that's true, that there's a certain um, cultural uh, sympathy towards young artists living in garrets and, you know, all of that. But where, as you get older, there's a, I, there's a sort of feeling of contempt that can creep in to think, well, what, you should have looked after yourself by now. 
can you know? Maybe because, you know, we're also accustomed to thinking that money is the most important thing to know about, that money, knowing about money equals wisdom, you know, that's what wisdom yeah. might become, which is terrifying. Um, let's talk about Wendy because she's only, we've only really talked about Finn in relation to Wendy, yes. but she is, um, she has her own character. <laughs> Wendy is a sort of public intellectual. She's been a feminist scholar. Um, her work has been famous around the world for her sort of, you know, searing critiques of po politics and power and, um, the patriarchy, etc. Her books of her early years are still on university lists around the world. Uh, and she's writing another book sort of in the back of her head, uh, which she feels is this is actually going to be her, her, her really, her best work. Um, Wendy is the only one of the women who has children. She has two adult children, one of whom lives overseas and one who lives near to her, but who's quite her name is Claire and she's sort of fairly disapproving of her mother's um, sort of chaotic lifestyle, which basically Wendy's two loves are work and Finn. And her third love was her darling, darling husband, Lance, who died sort of 20 years before uh, the book opens. So um, she, she's the kind of mother who uh, sort of prided herself on giving her children lots of freedom and um, sending them out into the world without, you know, all this, um, you know, helicopter parenting and so on. And you sort of gradually trickles through the realisation that maybe her kids don't actually see the way she mothered them as an, a wonderful uh, granting of freedom and that perhaps it might have been a bit more akin to a kind of neglect. Um, you use the phrase trickled through the book then. One of the things that I think you do brilliantly in this book, in fact, probably in natural way as well, is you thump us into the situation without too much um, backstory or lead up. And I think it's a very bold thing, but it also means that there's a sense of kind of urgency from the beginning. You know, um, maybe could you just, just, this is a bit of a writerly question, but could you talk a bit about backstory and how to manage it? And, you know, the fact that you haven't told us a whole long litany about where they met and how mm. they met and all that, and yet we kind of accelerate into that quite effortlessly, it seems. Um, maybe just, would you just talk about that for a minute? Thank you. Yes. Well, of course, it was entirely effortless to write the whole book. <laughs> uh, uh, it was not, of course. Um, yeah, look, I, I don't know if this is just a personal thing, but I find, well, there are two reasons that I didn't do a lot of backstory. One is that I wanted these women to not be, I think a lot of the time when we think about uh, representations of older people in books or TV and whatever, there's um, quite a lot of people, not a lot, sometimes it is an older person sitting on a couch or in a hospital bed or in a nursing home, remembering the past because the past is where everything happened. And, you know, youth is where real living took place and old age is just a kind of uh, waiting to die place. And I don't, I don't believe that is true. Um, for, for, for most people, as you get older, your life is still as um, you're being, your life is being lived just as, um, urgently, possibly more urgently than it was at, you know, 50 or 40 or 30. Um, so I didn't want them to be constantly sitting around remembering the glory days. Um, but also I find a lot of backstory and flashback and stuff in books very, I find it can be dull for want of a better word. It can, it also stops the movement of a story forward. And when you have a kind of, um, you know, domestic, small, small story like this, I mean, the, the books that I love the most in the world are ones that could be described as domestic and small, when actually they are entering the, the great depths of the human heart. And that's the kind of book that I absolutely adore. So I don't think they're small. But in terms of, you know, event and... Um, that would probably make Mrs. Dalloway quite small, wouldn't it? Exactly. Mrs. Dalloway, um, yeah. Olive Kittredge, yeah. uh, anything that Anne Enright writes about families, you know, mm. these books are, are 
are great works, but they're about um, ordinary people in smallish spaces. So when you have a book like that, I think you need to be very um, as skilled as you can be about about narrative flow and narrative um, movement. So the way that I prefer to do the kind of backstory is just to drop in little droplets of it um, rather than sitting down, have, stopping the narrative flow and then having a chunk of um, memory. I also don't think that's how I, you know, in my own life, I don't remember things in big chunks. I have little flitters of a memory, an image, um, a sensation, uh, a taste, you know, just sort of flying through my thoughts during the day. I don't, I don't stop my day and then go, right, I'm now going to remember, woo, you know, a, a scene from my youth. They also, it means also that the memory or the backstory, they can then become these little bombs in a way because you're employing something that, I personally think is incredibly difficult, but it's beautiful to read, which is, it's an incredibly close third person. So they're not I voices, but you're, it's like, it's like the, the God writer is actually really in close. And so it feels like you're inside them, but then these little memories and things become these explosions because we haven't had them. They haven't need to, needed to refer to them before, but mm. then they go off, you know, I mean, the first time we learn, well, some of the things in the book. It's like, what? But it's because it's ordinary to them. They don't, it's not yeah. a big thing. Can you talk about that close third person a bit? Yeah, I found that hard. Well, I've, I've mainly, I think, written in this close third person, which is to say, you know, Ailsa looked out the window, you know, and saw whatever. But A leaf but, blower. But a leaf blower. <laughs> I also saw the grim violence of the leaf. <laughs> so whatever you're seeing is seen through the prism. Whatever Ailsa in my book is seeing is seen through the prism of Ailsa's personality, her desires and all of that. But it's still kind of a little outside you. Um, so I've always, mostly always written like that. But what I've done before is have first chapter. So say in the natural way of things, the chapters were from the point of view of one, Verla, Next chapter, Yolanda. Next chapter, Verla. Next chapter, Yolanda. Which is um, a perfectly acceptable way of doing things and, and a lot easier than having the kind of shift that I have in this book. So for me, the, it was a kind of technical challenge in this book to manage this very fluid shifting point of view um, still within that close third person um, um, format or whatever it's called, technique. Um, so, but I wanted to have that shifting point of view because I, I needed, you know, because a lot of the book is about this, um, this kind of, um, slippage in communication or in perceptions of, of ourselves or, um, the, something that's happening. So I needed them to be together pop around their heads quite a lot which is I know very kind of um discouraged in writing courses and stuff it's called head hopping and it's a terrible crime um but especially when you look at um books that were written sort of in the um 70s 80s it's really I feel like my book The Weekend is a kind of slightly old-fashioned stylistically where that kind of um movement was very common in some of my really favorite writers of that period like um, Alice Thomas Ellis or Nina Borden. Um, so, so I want to have them in the kitchen together and, um, you know, Wendy's unpacking her groceries and thinking, oh, this is not bad, while the others are looking and going, oh, my God, I can't believe she brought that you know, mangy bag of, you know, wet, slimy lettuce. What the hell is she doing? <laughs> but none of this well, is you know, it's, it's a great thing. It's a great thing, isn't it? Because it absolutely... Um, to me, it absolutely articulates that, that maxim that, you know, you can't judge a person's exterior, interior from their exterior, which, of course, is kind of what they're doing all the time. And it's what's so delicious is that, that you're getting to hear their take on each other as they unpack the boxes. And it's, and it's, what, we, it's what we all do, right? We all do that all the time. Mm. And one of the things, I guess, 
about these women is how they really love each other, but they're quite critical of each other. Um, sometimes they're critical of each other for, you know, they feel that they're sort of being protective, you know. So, um, you know, Adele, who's a person of the body, she's very fit, she's very beautiful, she's got great boobs that she's very proud of. Um, she, she sort of wishes that Wendy would um, just dress a bit better, you know, because Wendy doesn't care about anything but work. So she, she doesn't dye her hair, she wears these crappy old sort of hippie clothes. And Adele well, actually, is like, on that, on that, why don't you read the bit that oh, okay, you yeah, okay. read? Because I, I actually think the bit that you've chosen is, is a perfect example too of, I mean, it's, in a way it's the character as sort of God having a look at things, but it's also, it felt to me when you suggested it, like it was kind of like the novel, that's what the novelist does. You lay out the world and you kind of look at it. So anyway, um, let's have a bit of a read. Okay. Thank you for this. Uh, this is when they're, they're sort of all coming together at the beach house. Adele is late she's always late and when she gets there she sort of can't really find them she's there they're somewhere here but she just thinks she might have a just a quick little nap they're already working cleaning out the laundry so when Adele woke she was very hot and groggy she got up and went outside stepping across the deck boards down below she could hear Wendy's high wheedling voice bloody hell it was true she had brought the dog Adele leaned out to see Finn, the crazed, doddering creature, standing stiffly in the hottest corner of the deck. Wendy stood there too, squinting in the blinding sunlight. Why would they not move somewhere into the shade? Adele almost called out, but something downcast in Wendy's stance stopped her. She stood there with her hands limp by her sides in her grubby white t-shirt and a drab brown wraparound Indian skirt. Adele loved Wendy, but why must she dress like a witless old hippie? It was not dignified. It made her look mad. Why would she do nothing about her appearance? Adele was afraid for her the way she exposed herself, her wild grey hair, her overstretched t-shirts with their logos and activist slogans, their fraying, rippling collars drawing attention to the loose flap of flesh at her throat. Today, she wore brown leather thongs on her long feet. Adele had seen those thongs close up, the way the soles had cracked and taken on the heavy shape of Wendy's big mannish feet. The blackened toe marks made Adele feel a bit sick in some unnameable way. How could Wendy not understand that at their age, nothing was more important than looking at the very least as if you were sane? Sometimes she wanted to grasp Wendy by the shoulders and shout at her, you are old, nobody wants to see this. Adele knew the others thought her trivial and she knew that they were right and that in some way this frivolity had damaged her life. She had not tried to develop her intellect in the way they had. Even Jude, whose job in the restaurant had after all really been rather menial, Adele breathed out, imagining for a moment having the nerve to say such a thing. She would not, ever. And Jude, who for all these years was just a kept woman, another breath. Even Jude somehow understood complex things about the world, about international politics and art movements and ancient history and the names of the smaller cities in places like Jordan or Norway. How did that happen? from being a glorified waitress and falling in love with a rich married customer 40 years ago. And Wendy, well, that was her work, thinking. Adele envied their logical minds, their cool reason. Resigning herself to this complete lack in her own character had been very painful. But at the same time, she knew she had different, lesser, but still valuable things to offer. She had intuition she had humanity and beauty what was wrong with that in such ugly times what was wrong with wanting to take part in the world gently with civility and attractiveness it enhanced the world enriched it to create even the smallest pocket of beauty why must women be like men anyway competing controlling at war all the time Finn stood in that strange way at the corner of the deck, 
his face close to the railings, but absolutely motionless, staring straight ahead. How old the poor dog was now, scrawny despite his swollen belly and ragged of spirit. It had been some time ago that Wendy was advised he must soon be put down, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. Poor Wendy. Adele saw something vulnerable in her friend standing there. A great weariness, something in the slope of her shoulders. Adele wanted to cheer her, but now Jude too appeared on the deck and Wendy stiffened to attention. Adele would save them from each other. She leaned right over the railing and called out in a jolly voice, hello girls. The two women's faces turned upward to the sun, to Adele. At the same instant, they each lifted a hand to shade their eyes in a motion Adele had seen hundreds, thousands of times through all the decades of their friendship. She remembered them from long ago, two girls alive with purpose and beauty. Her love for them was inexplicable. It was almost bodily. She was conscious of a breaking a bad spell, releasing them all. Oh, finally, said Jude. I see you've got yourself the best room, called Wendy. I'll come down, Adele called back from her stage. Her mood lifted. It would be all right. They needed her, Jude and Wendy. She would protect them from each other. She slipped lightly down the stairs. It's brilliant and thank you because it actually goes to a whole heap of things I want to ask you about. So first of all, that thing about old, um, she uses that word twice, I think, during the course of that little tiny reading. And um, there's a, it's a real taboo word, isn't it? You and I have both, I know, just written pieces for the Griffith Review. Mm -hmm. When I turned 60 and I said to people that I was old, people were absolutely appalled that I would use the word. Mm. And it seems to me like something perfectly wonderful um, to have got to be, to make old bones. But when does old kick in? I mean, it's really interesting because old is like, don't say that. Yes, old is, some, I read someone saying, old is always 10 years older than you are. <laughs> so um, I think, look, I say old all the time as well. And I, I, it's been interesting going about, you know, re reading and talking about this book. And quite often someone in the audience, often a very... Um, well-dressed, uh, um, vibrant sort of woman will say, oh, that was very interesting. But, you know, I really don't like this, this talking about 75 as if it's old. And I find that kind of hilarious because how old is old? I mean, the life, what's our life expectancy? 86 or something. You're not, you know, I don't understand the kind of aversion to it, except course I understand that people don't want to be thought of as old because we treat old people like shit so um particularly at the moment when you know the numbers the numbers that are reported of people dying in the coronavirus um epidemic you know there's a sort of a thing of oh well they're old people as though yeah. in some way that's not this deep loss to society sorry that's a personal yes end. but also a deep <laughs> loss to you know individuals mm. um mm. to families and whatever I've I've been interested to hear from a couple of people that their parents, you know, their mother or their father, whatever, in a, maybe in a nursing home, you know, obviously in great um, distress at the moment um, in that they're not allowed to have visitors and all of that. Uh, but these people have said, well, I'm not dying of that, you know, <laughs> because, um, and I totally get it. You know, I, you know, I understand that you, I would want to have my own individual death. Thank you very much. I'm not going to have just some thing where I'm wiped out in a bunch of people. It's that thing of the idea of being old reduces people to all the same thing. And it's kind of like sexism or, um, you know, misogyny that, that puts women all into one thing, which is, you know, sluts and whatever. So that kind of reductive thinking about being older. I can't wait for that Griffith Review um, edition to come out because I think it's going to be full of really fascinating stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, going back to Adele on the balcony, on her stage, um, she also talks about envy. And, you know, envy is a thing that we meet a little bit in this book. And I think it's a wonderful thing to have touched on it because 
too often for me, friendship is painted as this kind of rosy thing. And over decades, friendships have to survive enormous strains. And one of them is envy. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe just talk a little about negotiating that? Uh, because people have said of these characters, oh, they're not always likeable. They're under enormous pressure, mm -hmm. but also they've got this backstory. So perhaps would you just talk a little about the putting in the little darker stuff and how you balance that? Because it's, it's anyway, sorry, that first. Mm. Um, yes, it's interesting. I'm always fascinated by people who say, well, they're not very likeable. And I sort of think, well, doesn't it depend what you like? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like spiky people. I like yeah. people who, who are not, you know, um, I don't know. I like people who speak their mind and who mm. will kind of admit to things that are not particularly um, flattering and so on. So, uh, and also I, I think when you've been friends with someone for 40 years, it's kind of like a family relationship. Um, you're not always the most loving and po overtly polite to your closest people, you know? So I feel that uh, it, I don't know. I, I feel that it's truthful to have these kind of spiky um, uh, interactions between them. And also, as you say, they're all in deep grief. They loved Sylvie so much. And Sylvie was the one who seemed to manage to, come, to smooth over their spiky edges. So I'm know, interested in that. Do you think that if one of the others, I mean, you know who Sylvie was better than we ever will. You know, if Jude had died, I mean, it's a question about really relationships and and closed worlds, isn't it? That if one of the others had died, would they have had an equally tense thing, I wonder? Well, I think they would discover what that person did for the group mm. once they've gone, you know. Mm. Um, and I also think this, the adoration that they will have for Sylvie is it's something that happens when a person does die, who we've loved, but their kind of faults and things fall away and they're... And they're um, you know, the, the fine qualities are the, the ones we hang on to, which is great, but it means we can also romanticise them and, and romanticise what life would be like if they were still here. So, you know, they often... They have to the become women, perfect for a while, don't they? Yes, and each mm. of the women thinks, oh, if Sylvie was here, we wouldn't be having this little narky, you know, tiff about Christmas cake. Or if Sylvie was here, she could explain to me why Wendy's being so stupid and not getting a lift in a proper car and bringing that terrible, crappy, broken down car that she should have got rid of ages ago, blah, blah, blah. So they feel that, um, yeah, that, that Sylvie would have prevented the kind of ill feeling that happens between them. But, mm -hmm. but when you're grieving, it's very easy to be intolerant of other people. I mean, I've, I've seen it in myself, you know, mm -hmm. that, that idea of, look, you know, this is important and that is not important right now. And my grief is bigger than anybody else's grief. You know, that, yes. I know that one. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, my grief is actual grief where, you know, Jude, I think, uh, relates a story about seeing Daniel and not long after uh, Sylvie died and, and he starts telling her about his cousin who died and she's thinking, what are you telling me this for? You know, people die, of course, you know, your cousin's going to die. But, that's of no interest to me because Sylvie died. And, you know, I've certainly had, you know, I think there's a great lot of very primitive, um, quite savage emotions that come out in grief. And they don't always um, mean that you behave beautifully, compassionately towards everybody around you. Mm -hmm. I just think that's how it is. So my women, they're also stuck there together in this house. As you say, like so many people are right now and pressure builds when you are there together. I mean, of course they don't have to be there together, but they kind of do because, because they always have, you know, mm. and several times through the book, one or other of them says, why are we still friends anyway? We just are. Which is that question, isn't it? That, that the book explores, I think, consistently, um, and as the kind of God writer, we've only got a couple more minutes left, as the kind of, you know, the person harnessing all these energies, it seems to me that you employ two things, one of which you have used before, I think in natural way of things, you used very strongly, the thing of invoking beauty to offset 
you know, offset what might be happening. But the other one in this one is humour. And I think it seems to me writing and acting and, you know, any kind of dealing with humour is the hardest thing. I think writing dark is hard, but, you know, writing mm. humour is so technically difficult. Can you just maybe finish up with what it is to inject humour into the world as a kind of craft-based idea? Well, thank you for asking about that because I really wanted to write a book that made people laugh. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, again, it's interesting. Some people see it as a hilarious book and some people see it as a very sad book. Uh, so, and I think a lot of that um, response tells you about your own attitude towards ageing, for example. I mean, a couple of people have been just sort of, who I've heard on the radio or whatever, have, have talked about it being horrifying. And I'm thinking, really? What's horrifying? The fact that they're getting old is what horrifies some people, which I find completely fascinating. But humour humor is so important in literature, I think. Partly it's... Um, it just allows light and shade for starters, which life is absolutely full of light and shade. And we all know that even in the most um, terrible moments of loss and grief, I mean, I don't know a single person really who's talked about being at the deathbed of a loved one where something funny hasn't happened, you know, um, in, in hospitals or, you know, sort of bungles and blunders about, um just people coming in who don't know what's happening or anyway that's sort of by the by but um you it's know sort of high emotional stakes too isn't it that gives you an opportunity if you're good enough as a writer to get in there and find the humor and it also uh, it's very useful for this self-delusion sort of theme so that i can have um adele thinking well I look pretty damn good, you know, and she wears her very sexy bathing costume on the beach and, and she feels a bit sorry for the others because they're all shrouded up in their linen, you know, scarves and their, or their <laughs> pants because they're too ashamed of their bodies, whereas she is, feels free and sensuous and open to the world. And then one of the others will think, oh, my God, poor Adele, she still thinks she can get away with that costume. It's sort of poor thing you know so they're each often thinking of each other as oh, poor you i'm doing great but you're you know you could um yeah it's but so it's tricky it's, isn't it because i mean the, the the thing about humor is a particular way of observing the world i think that and listening maybe listening because it feels like you're listening to rhythms not just speech and stuff like, and 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 those sorts of things but kind of rhythms too because the prose often has a rhythmic twist that makes it funny. Um, yes, you can do that yeah. undercutting thing that, um, you know, yeah. Elizabeth Strout is a real master of that sort of um, building to a sort of point of pressure and then just undercutting it with a yeah. little jolt of some observation that's kind of blackly funny, maybe. That Which may I say, really I, think, I think you do magnificently in this book. Oh, and that's, you know, you. I think it's one of the great hallmarks of this book, the way you flip and manage to sort of, you know, change those things around sorry i think i blacked out a bit for a minute there right. which is timely because we have to finish um i know um but i should say before we do and before i thank you for the book and uh, your time that the weekend for people who don't know this will be published in the uk in june and in the usa in august which is thrilling so congratulations Charlotte. Thank you very going out into a strange world but it will be a wonderful thing for people who discover it but meantime, it can be bought via the link to McLean's Booksellers, which is in the session description on the festival website. I'm pointing down there as though it's doing <laughs> that's why. Um, also, look, the festival really appreciates how terribly tough times are, and that's why they've made all these sessions available for free. But if you happen to be one of the people who's in a position to make a donation to support this incredible initiative, um, perhaps you could also click on the donation link in the session description. I just want to say a thank you to Rosemary Milsom for her passionate commitment to writers and writing. And I want to thank Charlotte for giving us a really extraordinary, beautiful book that oddly now feels like a little warning of how we might all conduct yeah. ourselves in these times. But I promise you, it will take you away from the worries of what's out there into a world that will give you some brilliant laughs and you might find yourself there quite often. Um, I think thank you, Elsa. 
I just want to um, echo the thanks to Rosemary and everyone at the Newcastle Writers Festival and to McLean's Books and all the independent booksellers yeah. who are still hanging in there. Right now, I'm going to get a bit teary. Um, they are doing free deliveries. They're bicycling books around to your house. So please support independent booksellers right now. Um, and amazing. you know, nothing takes you into another world like reading does. And I promise you, the weekend will take you to a place that will reward you richly. And I'm sure we both hope to see you all in Newcastle in 2021. Um, in that terrible cliche, but heartfelt one. Stay safe and keep reading. Thank you, Ayasa. Thanks, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.